You're listening to a message from Gateway Church Geelong. We hope it blesses you. For more information about Gateway, visit gc.org.au. When our children were young, we decided to buy them a special gift, very expensive gift, each one of them. And we hid it away and we just wanted to see what their surprise would be, how they would react when they saw their gift, this gift. Christmas morning came, as usual, they would come into our room. What is it for me? And each one got chocolates. Danny and Rachel said, uh, oh, gee, thank you. <laughs> Tried, trying to sound happy. The only one that was happy is the one that loved chocolates. <laughs> Naomi. Then we said to them, look outside. So they went and looked outside. And when they saw their brand new bikes... They were really excited, really excited. So who loves getting gifts? Who likes receiving gifts? I think we all do. If I was to offer you something that was supernatural and life-changing, would you be interested? Then let me share with you this amazing gift that Jesus promise his disciples and it's available to us today you can receive this gift today you know the bible says God gives good gifts to his children in Luke 11 verses 9 to 13 Jesus said so I say to you ask and you shall receive Seek and you shall find. Knock and shall be opened unto you. For everyone who asks receives. And he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks it will be open. If a son asks for a bread from any father among you, would you give him a stone? Or if he asked for a fish, would would you give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asked for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Jesus is talking to believers. He's talking to believers. How much more? How much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those that ask him? In Matthew 7 verse 11, corresponding understanding of that scripture, he said, If you, imperfect as you are, know how to lovingly take care of your children and give them what's best, how much more ready is your heavenly Father to give wonderful gifts to those who ask him? You know, one of the things that, sorry about this, I've had a bit of a cold through the week, but one of the things that fascinates me, and even today, I love hearing the last words of a person about to leave this earth and go to heaven. I'm talking about Christians now. Dawn Elliott, who is a friend of the church, loved by many in this church, When Glennis went to see her, she started to speak to her, to to Glennis. And she spoke of how much she, she was thankful of the fact that she was saved. She had eternal security. She had a confidence that she was going to heaven. And she was going to be with her beloved husband, Leslie, that she hadn't seen for years. But even more than that, to be with her Lord and Saviour. For all eternity. What an amazing last words to have before you left this earth. What do you think Jesus' last words would be? What was his last words to his disciples? Amazingly, it wasn't no. It wasn't so go. 
It was to remain, to wait. His last words to his disciples was to wait, wait. And this shows us the importance of what was to come. Jesus said in Luke 24, 49, Behold, when that word is used at the beginning of a sentence, it means take note, I have something important to say to you. I want you to listen up. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but wait, tarry, wait in the city of Jerusalem until you're endured or clothed with power from on high. In Acts 1 verse 4 and 5, he reiterates the same message. And being assembled together with him, he commanded them. He didn't just say wait this time. He commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized in the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Don't do any preaching. Don't lay a hand on the sick. Don't cast out devils. Wait. I want you to wait until you receive the promise that God has for you. Then Jesus went on to in Matthew, sorry, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you shall receive, this is the words of Jesus, you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You see, this power is a clothing. It's a clothing of power from on high. And that's what the Father has promised us, this clothing of power from on high. You know, a few years in Life magazine, there was a picture of a straw that had penetrated a light pole during a tornado. How can a fragile straw penetrate a light pole? It was because of the power of the wind that picked it up and drove it towards the pole. Well, Jesus has promised a power far greater than that that you and I need to receive and wants to, and he wants us to receive it. You see, there are 23 Hebrew and Greek words for power in the Bible. And the one that Jesus used in this particular verse was the explosive power. It's the dynamite power. It's the same word used for dynamite. You will receive dynamite power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. But what is the purpose of this promise? And this is the crucial key the Holy Spirit wants us to hear. What is the, cre- what is the promise or the purpose of the promise of this baptism in the Holy Spirit? The first and foremost purpose is that your life and my life becomes more like Jesus. That's the purpose, to become more like Jesus, to be like Him. In Mark 3, and I love this verse, Mark 3, 13 and 14, Jesus went up in the mountain and called to himself those that he himself wanted and they came to him. And you know, that's what happened to you and I. Jesus has called us to himself and praise God, we have responded, we've come to him. Then it goes on to say in verse 14, then he appointed 12 that they might be with him. What did he call you for? Why do he want you to receive this promise for? That you might be with him. Then he sent them out. Sometimes we get too close, we get too far ahead of ourselves. And we focus, unfortunately, at times more on his hands than on his face. He called us to himself. He wants us to receive this promised gift from the loving Heavenly Father because he wants us to be like him. He wants us to be with him. And when you're with him, church, You are changed to be like him. You see, the enemy wants your devotion. He wants your devotion. He's out to steal your devotion. And Jesus is saying, I want you to receive this gift because I want you to be with me. Because in my presence, you'll learn to become more like me. And then the Bible says he equipped them, verse 15, to have power to heal sicknesses, to cast out demons and to preach his word. And you see, this same promise is for us today. The same promise is for us today. Why did he equip them? 
Because Jesus wanted them to continue the work that he came to do. Jesus wanted them to continue the same work that he came to do. In John 14, 12, it says this, I'll tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me, anyone, that's us here, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works because I'm going to be with my Father. In John 3, verse 8, for this purpose, for this purpose was the Son of God manifested that he might destroy the works of the enemy. This is the purpose. Destroy the works of the enemy. And you and I, an extension of Christ's purpose. And that is to destroy the works of the enemy. What an amazing privilege. What an amazing privilege that you and I have to extend the work. You see, the book of Acts is an unfinished book. There's 28 chapters, but there's more chapters to be written. And Gateway Church is about to write some chapters, some more chapters, because we wanted to continue the work that Jesus called us to do. What are the works of the enemy? Fear. The enemy instills fear by challenging the promises of God that he has for us. Lies. He lies to us every day. The devil knows our insecurities and he plays on it. He tries to get us into wrong believing and wrong confession. You know, just the other day, Glennis and I went to have coffee with friends of ours from Adelaide. And the lady, uh, she made this statement. She said, why do, you allow, why do we allow the enemy to constantly bring up the past? There's a guy that I used to visit and see on a regular basis for quite a few years. And he would constantly remind me of his past, the problems that he had. And the Holy Spirit said to me, tell him. I said, okay, Holy Spirit, I will. Tell him his rear vision mirror is bigger than his front screen. He's seeing more behind him than what I have purpose for his life in front of him. Then she went on to say, sometimes we are more sin conscious than righteousness conscious. And I thought, wow, you're speaking our language. We believe the same thing. And this is one of the reasons why Jesus wants us to have this this powerful promise operating in our lives to break us free from these negative thoughts. Remember, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. I can't use human weapons against the enemy. But they are powerful to pull down strongholds. Negative thoughts can become strongholds in our minds. Fear can become a stronghold. What is a stronghold? A stronghold is a mindset impregnated with a sense of uh, hopelessness. I can't seem to free myself of this fear, this worry, this anxiety, this feeling of insecurity. And yet God says, I've given you power to pull down those strongholds. Listen to what Jesus said in Luke 10, 90. Behold, again, when he uses that word behold, he says, take note, listen, I'm about to say something extremely important to you. Behold, I give you, I give you, come on church, I give you authority. This is Jesus talking to us. I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. I give you authority. I give you the authority to do it. The question is, how? How do you trample on serpents and scorpions? It's speaking about the works of the enemy. How do you do it? You trample Satan with words. Words. In Revelation 12, 11, 
They overcame him, Satan, by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. What did they testify? They testified to the power of the blood in their lives. I'm cleansed because of the blood. I'm washed because of the blood. My sins and my lawless deeds he remembers no more because of the blood. I can come to the throne of grace with boldness because of the blood of Jesus Christ. You and I have such a confession to speak against the enemy that would constantly lie and try to steal from us the things that God has purposed and planned for our lives. In Jesus' temptation, in Luke 4, Jesus said, It is written. He used the word. Always use the word. When the enemy tried to tempt him with certain things, it is written. You shall worship the Lord God and him only shall you serve. You see, Jesus used the word under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and so can I and so can you. In Hebrews 4.12, my word, this is God speaking, for the word of God is living. The word is living, it's active, it's sharper than a two-edged sword. We have the privilege, not to leave our, the, the sword on the mantle, please, but to read it. We have the word of God. And so you trample the word of God. Jesus trampled the scorpions, the snakes and the scorpions with the word of God. He's trampled the enemy's lies with the word of God. And so we have that same privilege because God's word is powerful, absolutely powerful. And Holy Spirit wants to impart that into us in our thinking daily. His word is powerful. Jeremiah 29, 23 verse 29 says, Is not my word like fire? The word of God's like fire. Says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rocks. Got any rocks in your life? The word of God will break it. As you declare it in faith. The word of God will break that word over your life in, the, in anything negative. In Mark eleven twenty three, 23, and I love this verse, most assuredly, Jesus talking to us, I say to you, Jesus is saying this to us, I say to you, Gateway Church, whatever you say, whoever says to this mountain, you got mountains that you want to see a breakthrough in? Be removed and cast in the sea. And this is the key. Does not doubt in his mind. Does not doubt. But believes. Believes. Don't doubt. Doubt will cause you to vacillate. Should I? Shouldn't I? Will I or won't I? Is it really true or isn't it true? Has God said? But believes that those things he says will be done. He... You, she will have whatever you say. You will have whatever you say. This is Jesus' words. If, I'm say, if I keep saying to myself, I'm hopeless, I'm no good, I can't amount to much, I can't do it, you will have whatever you say. Unfortunately, that's the truth. But if you speak the word of God over your life, you will have what you say. But our mind needs to be renewed daily. Romans 12, daily renewed. And that's why this promise that Jesus spoke about is so powerful and exciting. And we need it, church. We need it today. Don't wait till tomorrow. We need it today. Back to the promise. It was the baptism in the Holy Spirit that totally revolutionized the disciples' lives. I began to look at their lives prior to the baptism in the Holy Spirit. You take, for instance, Peter. Before he was baptized in the Holy Spirit, he was unpredictable to say the least. He didn't know what was going to come out of his mouth. You met anyone like that? I won't say. <laughs> On one occasion before Jesus was crucified, he, he said three times, 
I don't know. I don't know him. I spent three years with him, but I don't know him. I don't know him. Who, who are you talking about? Never met him before. But your accent betrays you. I don't care. I don't know him. But after he was baptized in the Holy Spirit, he became a powerful and effective follower of Jesus. Powerful, effective. And that's what God called, called us to be. Powerfully effective for his glory and honor. In Acts 4.13, listen to what it says. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. They were blown away. Can't believe it. And they realized that they had been with Jesus. I'm too busy, Pastor. I'm too busy. You should see what I've got on my plate. Can I advise you? Spend time with Jesus. Holy Spirit is always attracted to who you spend time with. Jesus. If you want the Holy Spirit's attention, spend time with Jesus. And that's God's intention for our lives. That's the foremost purpose of this promise. To be more like Jesus. And that's what Holy Spirit wants to do in your life and my life. To become more like Him. Let's make this a priority, church. Not just to be with Him, but God, I want to be like Him. In my walk, in my talk, in my manner of speech. I remember when I left my workplace back in Adelaide, the managing director came up to me and said, there's something about you, something different about you. You know, you never seem to get riled up. You never, you never curse, you never swear when you find yourself in having a problem and difficulty to get a job out. I was in the printing trade. And I said, it's because of Jesus. Because of Jesus. When I went to gym, after I came back from Adelaide, we spent a few uh, weeks in Adelaide. The guy that uh, I go to gym with, he says, something about you. He said, when you came in, I could see this glow over you. And I said, well, it's not me, it's Jesus. It's the presence of Jesus. I said, would you like to know him today? I'm still working on those two. <laughs> Vietnam vets. You see, that's where the power and authority comes from. The power and authority comes from, from you being with Jesus. Then he sent them out. But to be with him first, then he gave them authority. You take James and John. These are wild brothers, these two. I would say they were very competitive. Anyone here competitive? Don't put up your hand. I was very competitive. When Glennis would just about beat me with table tennis, I'd, I'd say, okay, I need to do something, Phil. Okay, let's go to the manual. Let's do some uh, spins and, and uh, cuts and uh, top spins. Then I'd beat her because I didn't want her to win. Beat me? No. Competitive. Well, God's healed me of that. And I'm more competitive for the glory of God. <laughs> You know, another thing about these disciples, and I, I, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find out when I get to heaven. I think they had a little, they had a little uh, conversation with mum over, over dinner time. Mum, could you um, talk to Jesus, ask this question to Jesus? So mum comes to Jesus and Jesus, um, can we talk about the seating arrangements in heaven? We'd, we'd like you to, uh, can you put my two sons, one on either side? of you when you get to heaven you see they had it all worked out another occasion in Luke, uh, Luke 5, 9 verse 54 we read of the Samaritans who didn't want to want Jesus to stay in their village and James and John see their response and when James the disciples James and John saw this they said Lord 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 
Do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just like Elijah did? Let's fry them like Elijah did. What did the baptism of the Holy Spirit do to John and for John? He was known as the apostle of love. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. That we call children of God. You're a child of God. And then in 1 John 4 verse 7, Beloved, beloved, let us love one another. Come on, let us love one another. For love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. It changed him. It changed him. And it will change you. It'll change you. You take Paul before his conversion. He couldn't wait to lock up those Christians. I just want to get them. I want to see them locked up. In fact, I'd like to see them killed. But after his, after his conversion and baptism in the Holy Spirit, his life was radically changed. Radically changed. Look at what he said in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 2. For I determine now, I determined not to know anything among you. I determined to know nothing else but Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Then Philippians 3.10. Paul had had an experience, out-of-body experience where he went to heaven. He saw things were unlawful for him to speak of. After that experience, it just burned in his heart such a passionate desire to know him, to know him. Philippians 3, 10, that I might know Him. I want to be passionately intimate with Him. The power of His resurrection, the fellowship of His suffering. I want to know Him. I don't want to know about Him. I can read scriptures to you about Him, even from the Old Testament, but I want to know Him personally. I want to come into that walk of relationship, of intimacy personally. It's my one desire. I forget those things that are on. I'm going to press on to know Him. I hunger for Him. I long for Him more than anything else. Everything else that they've done is just dung, just rubbish. But to know Him is my heart's desire. You see, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is given first and foremost to know Him. and then be like Him. And I believe that if we make that our first priority, then witnessing about Him will become much easier. Why? Because you carry Him. You carry His presence. You know, some people may feel guilty about witnessing to unbelievers. I don't know how to. I don't know how to. I'm too scared. My advice, don't focus on that. Don't focus on that. Focus on getting to know Jesus and you walk in relationship with Him and the rest will follow. Focus on Him. And then He can work through you by the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, when we... Oh, don't forget this, church. When we glorify Jesus, you attract the Holy Spirit when we focus on Him. Holy Spirit, you've got His attention. He's attracted. He's attracted when you're attracted to Jesus. He shall glorify me. He'll show you things. Be attracted to Him and you'll get the attention of Holy Spirit. Let's bring it down to earth, coming to a close. My wife, Glennis, 
when she received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, she received it six months before I do, and I wasn't happy. I said, God, I said, I know the Bible better than her, and I can pray. I pray more than her, and she gets it before me. So there was a silence in heaven for half, uh, six months until I humbled myself. <laughs> and um, as was their custom, we were in a traditional church at the time. She went to the ladies' prayer meetings once a week and they would sit around in circles, and each one taking turns. You know how it is when you hear someone praying, saying, oh, I wish I said that. I wish, oh, why didn't I come up with that thought? Anyway, they were all praying. Glennis prayed. Afterwards, they came to her and said, you're different. What is it? You're different. Your prayer is different. You're praying as if you know who you're praying to. It's so personal. What happened? What's, what's going on? Because of the promise. Because of the promise. You can receive that promise today. You know, for us personally, Gladys and I, our, ch- ch- our lives were dramatically changed. After Vietnam, readjusting to civic life wasn't easy. But we, we had a pastor who believed in us, who saw something in us. He saw something in us. <laughs> Would you believe it? He saw something in us all those years, this young whippersnipper. And never in our wildest dreams did we think we'd have the calling of God upon our lives. And we're here because of the grace of God. The grace of God. Let me finish with this question. Is God speaking to you this morning about the promise? The promise that He wants you to have? What should your next step be? Jesus said in Luke, in John 7, 37, 38, He said, if anyone is thirsty, that's a key. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me, come to Jesus and drink. He who believes in me, there's another key. Do we believe in him? He who believes in me, as the scripture said, out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. This he spake of the Holy Spirit. Whom those believing, those believing, that's us. Whom those believing in him would receive. Last verse. Luke 11 verse 13. Jesus said, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? You have not because you ask not. But if you ask, you will have. Is it a good time to ask this morning? I believe it is. We're going to pray and then I'm going to hand it to Pastor Lee and then we're going to come back and share how you can receive but also just for those that have have received that promise. (laughs) Paul said in Ephesians 6, uh, 5.18 I should say, he said, do not be drunk with wine, wear in excess but be filled the Holy Spirit. It's a continuous tense. It says, be being filled. Be being. That means, you know, sometimes we can drive with the red light on in our car. What's it saying to us? What's it telling us? It's empty. Sometimes through busyness, the things of life, the concerns and worries, the red light comes on. And we're still trying to live our lives. God says, I want you to be filled afresh. I'm talking to spirit-filled Christians. Today, be filled again and allow God to move upon your life.
God loves us so much that he's released the promise to the world. I, what I love about this morning is we've, as we've heard about the promise, it, it shows how much God values each and every single person on this planet. And the Holy Spirit was sent to release God's power, sent to, sent to release the will of God in us and through us. But before that, Jesus was sent to offer salvation sent to offer hope to a world that so desperately needs it. And maybe you're, you're in this place this morning, or you're watching online now at a later time. You're like, I, I want that hope. I want the hope of Jesus. I want salvation. I want that promise. It's as, it's as simple as this. The restoration of our hearts back to God is as simple as receiving Jesus as our Saviour. It's as simple as confessing with our mouth, believing in our hearts that God raised Jesus. If if that's you today, I want to invite you to pray a prayer after me this morning. If you're online, this is your moment to pray this prayer as well. Church, can I I invite you to pray the prayer with us? Maybe you're praying it for the first time or maybe you're you're praying it because you know that you need to get yourself back in a place with God. Let's pray this morning. Dear God, I thank you that you sent Jesus, the hope for all humanity. I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that you raised him. I surrender my life to you. Forgive me of my sin. From this day on, I choose to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. We pray that that message was a blessing to you. If you made a decision to follow Jesus, first of all, congratulations. We think that that is incredible. And secondly, if you go to gc.org.au forward slash first steps, our team has put together some resources as well as there's some information there for how you can get in contact with one of our pastors because we'd love to encourage you and connect you into the life of the church.